I'm on a floaty in a river. And the current, I don't control. But occasionally, okay, now it's my time to paddle. Control what you control and have that perspective that a lot of this stuff is beyond your control. Let's go! Eric, welcome to Fika with Rice. I'm excited to, to have you here on the show. You're a five-time best-selling author and have been voted the second most likable author in the world behind Harry Potter's J.K. Rowling. The social nomics work that, that you've written about has been seen on 60 Minutes to the Wall Street Journal and used by NASA. Mega, mega impressive. I wanted to start this episode with some rapid-fire questions. Our audience love it. It's become a tradition here at Fika with Rice. Uh, see it as an appetizer to this Fika. So it goes like this, Eric. I'll make a statement and then you'll finish that sentence. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. A little improv. I like it. <laughs> Very good. If I was 20 years old today, I would... Be outside, enjoying friends and enjoying the sun. Not on my phone. The biggest mistake I made when I was in college was... Partying too much. <laughs> you know what i've partied a lot too and i learned a lot about life during those parties you know yeah it's a good i had enough like i probably could have done yeah it's good okay when i grew up my biggest dream was to play in the national basketball association nba okay are you any good eric you know i wound up playing at michigan state college basketball so not bad not bad that was many uh, moons ago but yeah, yeah. above, so above some, average. Some, of the, some of my teammates made it to the nba that's amazing yeah okay the most common mistake entrepreneurs make is cash flow they forget they need to have cash to run the business when times are tough I agree with you 100%. I agree with you 100%. Cash flow is like your blood veins, you know, you need them. Yeah. The most common mistake people make when building their social presence online. They think about themselves, not the other people. What do the other people care about? We're, we're too selfish, you know. <laughs> yeah. It is true, you know. The best advice I received from my parents when I was young was... If you could dream it, you could do it. No, no. Excuses are worthless. You know, they're free. That's because they're worthless. Was it your mom or your father who said that? Both. It was Both. good. Yeah. yeah. The biggest misconception about having an online present is... Do you have to be perfect? I wish I knew when I was 25. That at 25, before kids, before owning a company, you've got a lot of time. Use it. Wiser. Go out and have fun, but also take a couple hours to write that book, to use that time. You've got so much time. You don't think you do, but you have unbelievable amount of time. I like to tell all our students that, Eric, you know, because they're like, you know what? I, I want to work at, I don't know, Google. I, I want to work at KPMG. I want to I work at JP Morgan. And I'm like, man, you have so much time now. Like now you're time rich. Use that because that's your commodity. When you have money, you don't have time. So it's that balance in life, you know? Yep. All right. To start this, um, I found something interesting. You had your teeth knocked out once. What happened? Yeah, I would say the best thing in my life that's ever happened to me is getting my teeth knocked out. And so we kind of talked a little bit about my dream as a kid was to play in the NBA. But here I am in high school and I get cut, kind of like Michael Jordan got cut as a sophomore in high school. I got cut as a junior. So I'm sitting there going, is my dream dead? But I still love basketball. So when I got to Michigan State, I just wanted to be involved. And so I became the water boy. They call it the manager. And I kept the dream alive. So I kept working out. I saw what it took to be on the team. I happened to grow two inches more. Um, didn't put on 50 pounds of muscle. I know that sounds crazy. You hear the freshman 15. I actually put on 50 pounds of muscle. 50 pounds, it's crazy to think about. But... So then my junior year, occasionally as a manager, there might not be enough players in practice, hurt, sick. So every once in a while, maybe once or twice a year, like, Kwame, we need you in there. You know, we just need a body. And so I go, OK, this is my time to shine. Uh, I think I'm good enough to make the team now. And I am lighting it up. 
everything, every bounce, the ball's coming my way, the balls are going in. I'm playing out of my mind. And then all of a sudden disaster strikes because I get hit by an elbow and I can kind of feel something jar in my mouth. But I was born with two teeth missing. So I had a, a single tooth that was a space or a fake tooth as it was. And so I thought that it was just this, I knew that something got dislodged. So I spit it in my hand and I thought it was just the fake tooth. But it turns out there's two other real teeth with it. But I'm kind of in the moment, the adrenaline's pumping. So I just kind of put the teeth down by the bench and keep playing for the next 20 minutes. Then the trainer eventually at a timeout sees like the blood still kind of coming out of my mouth a little bit. He's looking, he goes, you lost two real teeth, man. We got to get you to the dentist. And the whole ride to the dentist, I wasn't thinking about the pain. I was just like, my moment. I can't believe this just happened to me. What a bad break. Uh, but then looking back, I really realized it happened for me when I eventually walked on the team and then got full ride scholarship is that Coach Izzo is all about that grit, that grind. Like he loves guys that are hardcore. And so the next day I practice, Izzo goes, Quammen. And now I'm missing two teeth now for the rest of the semester, by the way. So I didn't have too many dates. But he goes, Quammen, I don't know if you're the toughest guy I know or the dumbest guy I know for keep playing, but it's probably somewhere in the middle. And that was his kind of nice way of saying, man, this guy's got the grit and the grind. So that really, if I would have made five more baskets that day, it wouldn't have done, it would have been better than me getting my teeth knocked out. It actually helped me to get those knocked out to show that I was willing to get back up. So that's what they wanted on the team. And got one of the 13 slots, got the scholarship. Uh, it was just, it was a great life lesson for me that things happen for you, not to you. Where do you think that grit is, like come from? Was it something that happened to you in your childhood or the way your parents raised you? Yeah, no, part of it, I grew up outside of Detroit. And so just up in the in that area, it's just kind of sort of in the water, so to speak. Uh, but yeah, definitely it's it's how my parents raised me. It's like, you know, get back up. No one really cares that you're hurt. Get, ba get back up, you know, and shake it off and keep going. And part of it too is nerves, right? I was just so nervous. I just you're out there, so you get that adrenaline. And you're just like, oh man, I can't believe I might make the number one team in the country at the time, Michigan State. So it's like some of those nerves, that adrenaline gets pumping. But mainly, it's just like keep going. You know, rub some salt on it. No one really cares about the bad breaks you're getting because they've got their own things to worry about. And so. Just go, hey, this is part of the process. This hurdle's there for everybody else to keep them out. It's not going to keep me out. Try to turn that hurdle into a springboard. What would you say to people out there, especially young people today, Eric? Like, do I find that a lot of 20 something today, they deal so much with anxiety and, oh. and social pressure due to social media and the digital digitalization and all of that like from your life lesson that you share right now what would you like to tell these people i'll just tell them hey when you start to feel that anxiety go this is normal don't like some people say just don't be stressed well then you're gonna be more stressed it's it's like when that stress comes in go this is part of the deal i'm trying to do something difficult and so as that stress comes in go okay this is part of the normal process but then think about what would be more stressful that's a weird concept but like for me if my kids got sick or something happened to my kids they got in a car accident whatever it is or a family member maybe it's a friend family member for me it's my kids but it could be your wife could be your spouse whatever if something happens could be same with my wife right my wife my kids and so then that gives you that perspective and so when you're stressed about something in business especially when it comes to work just kind of give it some perspectives. Try to think of something else that's actually more important. And so that's really about making sure you write down what's most important for you. That's why these vision boards are great throughout the year to look at them. I, I actually make them black and white and then I color them in each month how well I'm doing. If I'm focused on it, then I color it in more. And so at the center of every vision board I've ever done is my family. And so when you have things like this, it allows you to kind of have that perspective when that stress invariably comes in and understanding, wait, okay, did anyone die? No, like that's the extreme, like did anyone die over this? No, is anyone gonna die over it? No, okay, probably not. So then you walk your way back. So that's the advice I give the young people, give it, give it some perspective. 
So you would say like, let's say like a young person is like having their, their moment, this, this match in, in basketball, like you have some perspective, don't get too stressed up, so to speak. Um, is that correct? Yeah, just, yeah. yeah, when you're in that moment, go, hey, this is, this is a great opportunity. All I'm gonna do is do my best and forget the rest. And if you have a higher power like God, just understand, look, they're in control. I always like to think of it of I'm a floaty, like I'm on a floaty in a river. And the current, I don't control. But occasionally, for me, it's God, but whoever your higher power is, they're going to tell you to paddle. That's when mm -hmm. you need to get ready. But you're not controlling that current, that current of life. And so you've got to kind of go with the ups and downs, the ebbs and the flows, but then also be ready when you get that, okay, it's my turn to paddle. Whether it's you, it's, you want to write that screenplay for that movie, or, oh, this job opening came up that you've really been trying to get. Okay, now it's my time to paddle. Paddle towards towards that. But if you're paddling upstream all the time, that's that's an effort and futility. So it's really about understanding, w controlling basically what you can control, which isn't much. I know it's kind of crazy to say, especially for Americans, but it's really control what you can control and have that perspective that a lot of this stuff is beyond your control. Yeah, it is true. It is true. I think a lot of anxiety comes from like trying to control everything anyway. You know? Yeah. So. Yep. Eric, just by curiosity, how big is your vis visual board? Is it like an A4 or is it like a, this huge thing on the wall or is it like a, a tiny thing like in your notebook? Yeah, no, it's not like Jesse Itzler's big ass calendar. What it is, it's just, it's eight by 11. Okay. Eight by 11. Yeah, uh, it's just one. on my desk. Yeah, I don't think my maybe, maybe my wife would go for it if I blew it up and colored it. It's not a bad idea. Do you have the big ass calendar? I have one. No, no, I don't have it. No, no. <laughs> I saw Jesse a couple couple months ago in New York. So, okay, uh, it's it's amazing. It's amazing yeah. the calendar. I'm watching you right now. But for those who are listening, you're wearing green glasses. I'm curious why, Eric. Yeah, no, so I haven't always worn these crazy bright green glasses for people that are listening, but I have always been called Eric Qualman. And so whenever you're handed your email address, it's usually your first initial last name. And so Eric Qualman truncates down to Equal Man, uh, which sounds like a superhero. And for the first 15 years, I actually did not like it because you can imagine. So I worked at Yahoo back when they were kind of the Facebook of the day. Uh, couldn't do anything wrong. And so I'd come into meetings as an intern or as a junior person and they go, oh, we need some coffee. Well, Equal Man's kind of a superhero name. You must be fast. Why don't you go get some coffee? So it was good natured ribbing, but I didn't really like the word term Equal Man. Again, I was thinking this thing was happening to me, not for me. And then a moment in time, it all changed. So I was going to do, a, I just did a magazine interview uh, for one of the books. I think it was for Digital Leader. And they wanted to take a picture for the cover. And so they said, hey, we want to have some fun with this photo for the cover. Do you mind with your name, Equal Man, do you mind wearing some Clark Kent like glasses, Superman glasses? I go, no, that's fine. We can do that. And they go, well, do you mind if they're bright green? It's St. Patty's Day edition. I go, great. Yeah, whatever. whatever I it love takes. that. <laughs> yeah. And so they bring out these glasses. I was like, whoa, man, those are bright green. But I put them on. I went to Michigan State, so I'm like, green's good. Uh, and I don't think much of it. So a couple of weeks later, I fly to Kenya to give a talk. That's primarily what I do. I speak at large conferences. And the, the morning, the, the night before the talk, I went to a rescue shelter to adopt a baby cheetah. Uh, not to take her home. My wife would kill me, but just to support the local area. And on the ride over, the lady that I'm with, she says, um, you know, Usain Bolt, the Olympic sprinter, was here two days ago, and he adopted from the same litter that you're about to adopt from. And we filmed him, and we'd like to film you and marry that footage together so that we can raise more money for the shelter. I'm like, great, whatever it takes. And then she kind of pauses and looks at me and goes, but obviously when we're filming, uh, we want to make sure you're wearing your bright green glasses. And I look back at her and go, oh, I don't wear those around. I look like a fool walking around wearing bright green glasses all the time. And the look on her face, that look of disappointment, I never wanted to see it again. And that's when I had that epiphany, that aha moment. I said, oh my gosh, this isn't happening to me. This is happening for me. Instead of saying, I can't believe I'm equal, man, it's time for saying, I cannot believe I'm equal, man, and jump into uh, my true story. So fully step into my story. 
And I tell that story primarily because I think all of us are living the same movie. We're just different actors and actresses within that movie. So for all the listeners out there, it's really just a reminder, step into your story. A lot of you aren't because you're doing what I did for 15 years, which is it's uncomfortable to step into your full self. Yeah. Uh, but when you do that in the short term, it's uncomfortable, but long term, it's the most comfortable place you can live. And it's the best thing you can do for yourself and also for the world, because it is your own unique story. It's your own unique movie. Um, and for some of you out there that have stepped into your story, some of you are resisting that biggest chapter. There's something in your head that's telling you this is what I should be doing. And yet you put it off and you're putting it off because it's hard. Uh, right now, I've got this Harry Potter book. It's like a young adult book. I write business books. And yet this thing's been done for six years. And I, I think it's an excuse that I always say, well, I got to make sure it's the right timing so I don't you know, disrupt the marketplace so they don't understand that I'm writing this you know, young adult fiction book. That's an example of maybe that's my biggest chapter that I haven't stepped into and have been avoiding. So that's why I'm expressing it for the listeners is don't do what I did, which is resist your story for 15 years, step into it. Even though it's a baby step, it's gonna be really hard. Take that first step today. Yeah, like I'll, I resonate a lot with that, you know, Eric. I think a lot of people, especially young people, you know, they, again, you know, coming back to digitalization, that's because everything is public, you know? I think a lot of people, they wanna be perfect. They, you know, they wanna appear a certain way and um, they have to complexity, you know? And I think embracing your, your own self, your own story, your own life, um, turning that into your advantage, you know, like the way you have done it. Uh, I mean, it's beautiful. How did you become so specialized in digital leadership? And what is that for, for those that are, are hearing these words for the first time, digital leadership? So I've been in the digital space now three decades. I got on it early when I was in Detroit working for Cadillac uh, Automotive. So they need a digital presence. I just loved it. I love digital back when digital was literally four kids in the corner at a 10,000 person company. People didn't even know what it was. And so it's been amazing just to watch this explosion to where a world we live in, everything's digital. Um, but when I wrote the first book, Socialnomics, and I started speaking to a lot of companies, I was trying to get in there to talk to them about social, which made sense. Like, hey, this isn't just for teenagers. This stuff's going to change the way you live. And then I quickly realized, oh, my gosh, leaders, just because I'd been in the digital side for so long, I just had this context that everyone kind of understood that we live in a digital world. And then I realized, whoa, whoa, these people don't even know the basics of digital, these CEOs, these chairmen of the board, or these entrepreneurs. And so then I realized that they need to understand what digital leadership is. They understood what traditional leadership was, but the, the massive shift with everything being digital, there's some nuances that they need to understand in order to excel in the digital world. And so that's what I've been doing now for now 12 years. It's just all the books are under the umbrella of digital leadership, whether that's what happens in Vegas stays on YouTube, which is about your personal brand uh, and also your brand as a company um, and arranges the gamut to so my latest book, which you think, how is that related to digital leadership? It's called The Focus Project. It's kind of an anti-venom to the first book, Socialnomics, which was like, get into this stuff, get into it. You got to get into social media. You got to dig into it as a company. You got to dig into it as an individual. Then I saw everyone take their phones, especially younger folks, and jam that thing right in their face. And that's all that their life was. And so The Focus Project's telling them, look, you got to have that balance. You got to pull out a little bit. You've got to focus in this hyper-connected world with all these bizzes and bugs, bugs and pings that you've got to have that offline Flintstones balance with the Jetsons. Among digital leaders, um, you, you speak a lot about habits, so to speak. I, I'm still like, you know, like, I'm still trying to find the perfect balance between being super effective, balancing my role as like as an entrepreneur, a leader of, of our team, but also like as a parent, you know, of a little baby daughter. What are some like effective habits that you have seen among digital leaders? Yeah, we call it cowboy and cowgirl scheduling. Is, <laughs> okay, I love that. So, so think about the song like wide open spaces. So cowboy and cowgirl scheduling is you got to fence off. So fence off like a cowboy, cowgirl, certain areas of your time. So it might be you want to fence off, say, 6 a.m. for your daughter. 
six to six thirty, six to seven, whatever it might be. And then you leave wide open spaces rather than jamming that calendar completely full is you got to leave those wide open spaces for one life and also two for some blue sky thinking. You've got to give yourself some pause, especially at the role that you're in. If you're running a business, you've got to have that time where it's not operational pieces, but strategically thinking and pausing and giving yourself a break. And so that's one of the most effective things. Uh, the second most effective thing we've seen is that you literally write down what's the most important thing. What's the one thing that'll make everything else either easy or unnecessary. If I do this one thing, I might not even have to do these other things. Yeah. Uh, so an example for that might be, we do a lot of things at our edutainment company. We have animation, we sell books, we sell even you know, board games. And, but the main thing is me speaking on stage. So if we do that well, everything else normally benefits. And so, but the gravitational pull is for us to do this day-to-day -day items in the digital world. It's pulling at us, whether that's email, whether it's like, oh, you got to do this operational piece over here. And all of a sudden, week slips by. We haven't done anything on the speaking side in, in terms of like connecting with folks or reaching out or developing video. And so that's the key is number one, cowboy, cowgirl scheduling. Number two, writing down what's the one thing that if I do it well, makes everything else either easier or unnecessary. And then fence off usually a minimum, usually 30 minutes just to focus on that one thing, generally in the morning before the day attacks you. And so that's one of the best ways to keep focus. Eric, you, you're a father as well to two daughters. And how, how do you do it? How does like a how does this Wednesday look like for you? You know, so to speak, just to, to just for everyone to see how, how how it's like for you. Yeah, no, I think that we learned early on. So I was traveling quite a bit. Fortunately, my travel is not like McKinsey style travel where I'm there for a whole week. I usually fly the night before, speak in the morning, fly back. But sometimes okay. that could be five days in a row in five different cities. But I quickly realized, okay on my deathbed, I, I could travel every day of the year if we're lucky, but then I wouldn't see my, my girls. So we put a rule in place that 52 nights, 52 nights away from the girls. And so that's 50, you know, 52 weeks in a year. So it's one night a week on average for the whole year. And so we put in some guardrails in place. And so that's key. And then also too, is always just like the vision board, reminding mm -hmm. yourself, that a lot of us make the mistake because the family's there. You just take them for granted that they'll always, oh, they'll always be there. This thing, this fire is more important. This business fire, I got to put it out. But you know what? There's always going to be those business fires. And then all of a sudden, a day slips by, a week slips by, a year slips by, your kid's walking down to get their diploma, and you can't go back. No matter how much money you have, you cannot go back in time and so a good thought-provoking question is if someone close to you were to die today let's say it's your girlfriend it's your wife your daughter how much money would you spend to bring that person back to have just that last dance and the answer is all of it all your money and so you've got to remind yourself to be present that yes, there's that next deal to be had. Yes, there's that next step to take on the corporate ladder. But the thing that's going to matter the most when you talk to these people and go visit, I have, go visit retirement homes and just ask people what their regrets are. And 90% of the time they're going to say, I should have spent more time with my family. Literally, I've never heard someone say, Man, I wish I would have done this business deal. It is never, true. ever. Yeah. But I'm pro business, but I'm more pro family. And you can do both. And so you just got to put those railings in place so you're not sitting there trying to answer an email while you're talking to your daughter. It's like, no, yeah. it's my daughter's time. And I don't want to send her the wrong. People are like, our kids are all on their phones. I'm like, yeah, because you've been on your phone since you grew up when you're talking yeah. to them. That's what they're, they're mimicking your behavior. Yeah, I mean, kids, you know, they, they watch what we do, you know. I think they watch yeah. more than, than they listen, so to speak. For sure. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, what's the old saying is that your kids hear what you say, 
the the kids don't do what you say, but they watch what you do. Hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. But I love the fifty the fifty two rule, Eric. And obviously, family is super important to me. It's it's important for a lot of people. But do you have certain hours per day where where you have your fences, where you're only working and there's no like daughter and 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 father time or wife and and husband time is this some productive hours that you have that you're that you have set aside yeah a couple of things well first of all if i'm in town then there's always going to be daughter and, and wife time um when i travel it's a little more pressure because yeah. let's say i'm on the plane i go man i'd love to watch five episodes of ted lasso But you know what? If I do that, I'm not have time with my family when I get home. So maybe I'll watch one just to kind of decompress a little bit. But then the rest of that flight, I need to be writing the next book because this is four hours of time that if I waste this time, if I watch an NBA game, whatever it is, that I know that that's stealing from my family time when I get home because I didn't tackle these items that I wanted to tackle. And so that that's key. Then when in the house, obviously. Yeah, you've got to figure out, especially now everyone's working, a lot of people are working virtually. You've got to figure out what works well for you. So sometimes if I know I got to rock stuff out, I'm just going to go to the local library and just kind of be contained and, and work in there. And so you got to figure out what works best for you. But yeah, as much as you can, try to make these compartments, compartments separate. And then there's times when you can feather the two. So for example, when I write thank you notes, I still handwrite thank you notes. And so I'll handwrite a thank you note, and I usually make a little drawing on them, and we'll color them in. So I have the girls color in the items that I'm drawing. Let them do the envelopes. They like the stamp. Lick the. They don't lick them. No one licks the stamp anymore. But it sticks. You know, the kids that are in college have never licked the stamp. So they stick the stamp on the corner. You know, they help. So we're doing that together. So sometimes you can blend these things. So look for opportunities where it's that harmony. So I'm not a big fan of work-life balance. I'm a big fan of work-life harmony. So. Fence off certain places, but then in time, it's kind of like you let the cattle kind of go with the, the the cows and the horses mingle, and so look for those opportunities as well. Those are some amazing tips. I guess it's about yeah. carving out time when there is time, like mm -hmm. you were saying about the plane. All right, you have four hours. You know, yeah. I don't know. You are waiting to give a talk, and you have like two hours before. I don't know. You you bunch like reply to fifty emails or whatever. Just to, yeah. to stay productive when you're away, so to speak. So, yep. Yeah. And I've gotten better. Some days slip, but you got to look at your calendar a week out, three weeks out, four weeks out, five weeks out, and start to look at things. And if you're not excited, if it's not a hell yes, like hell yes, I'm excited about that, then you should probably remove it from your calendar. And the sooner you can do it, the better for both parties. Yeah. But then in time, you get better at not even adding that to your calendar. You get better at saying no, which is hard for a lot of us. But the better you get, successful people when we've interviewed them, one of the things that stands out that they're different than than others is they're really good at saying no, yeah. and that allows them to say yes to the big opportunities. And so, and they don't rely on willpower to say no. They have systems and processes in place. And I've gotten better in time, so that if I say no, it's usually pretty quick and just up front. Hey, this is a great opportunity. Thanks for thinking of me. Um, It's not for me right now because I'm heads down on this book. And I don't say it might be open in a couple of weeks if I'm not interested in it. It's just a hard no. And it actually helps that person out because then they can move on to the next person. Obviously, yeah. what helps out more is a yes, but a quick no is better than a long no. Yes, I agree with you. I, I, I started to, to get better at saying no. It's really hard. But yeah, yeah, it's really and hard. I, and I love the hell yes uh, concept. I, I love that. Uh, Eric. Yeah, that's an amazing advice. Like, hey, you want Super Bowl tickets? Hell yes. You want tickets to the premiere game? Yeah, hell yes. But then it's like, hey, do you want to go to this meeting with these? Well, I probably should. I probably should. Then that should be a no. Yeah. Because it's not going to get any better as that day approaches. It's only going to smell worse than the first it's true. reaction. It is true. So, And one thing that I, I learned from my from my uh, from my mother, Eric, is it's also more or less the same concept. But let's say you're being late for a meeting or something, you know you're gonna be late. So my mom always told me like, 
you know what? The earlier you tell someone about it, the more courteous it is, you know, because then people can like, they can manage their expectations, you know, but if you tell them like five minutes before that you're going to be 20 minutes late, people get upset, you know? So. Yeah. So I like your mom. She's smart. <laughs> Thanks, Eric. <laughs> Building a brand. Um, you're sort of an expert, Eric. What are the, the three most common mistakes people make when they start building their digital presence and, and, and online brand that are often not spoken about? Uh, number one, they don't put the audience first. Like, what does the audience care about? Um, two, they kind of figure out, they want to go, what's hot? Rather than figure out what brings them joy, what really is in their DNA They, and I've got speakers that are pretty successful, not amazingly successful, but they're pretty successful. And I see them switching their topics to what's the hottest thing. I mean, you can adjust to the times, but when you're like, oh, I'm going to start this company because this is white hot right now, and it's not what's at your core, that's a big mistake. And that holds true for your brand, whether it's a business brand or your personal brand. It's like, oh, people want this person's successful and try to mimic that person when it's not who you are, like step in your story. What's your true story? And then last but not least, and it kind of dovetails a little bit is that we try to be all things to all people. And so let's say I can speak on 10 different things. Let's say that that's the case. That's just overwhelming for someone that's trying to book a speaker. And so you got to make the hard decision of what's going to be your three. Most people think in threes, So anything more than three is difficult for people to grasp. So it's called the concept of threes. Whenever you write like a post, three things you should know. It's just, there's neuroscience behind it that as individuals, it's the, the largest thing beyond a pair. It, there's like some, some science behind why we like threes. But in time, if you get really good at what you do, then you kind of truncate it down to that one thing. So Brene Brown speaks on shame. Simon Sinek, why? You think about these brands, and it's really interesting. Um, for me, it's digital leadership. Sure, we write other books that are under that umbrella, but everything kind of funnels into that umbrella. Uh, you know, when you start out, Eric, I hear what you're saying about like trying to figure out what the audience want to hear, you know, and then yeah. like take it from from your own from your mm -hmm. own way, you know. But when you start, you don't have an audience. You're right. And I yeah. say audience, I mean like the general public. Okay. So here, let's say you start a business and you go out there and go, all right, um, I think that the, uh, well, let's first say you do this. If you do it right, you go, all right, this is what I'm passionate about. This is what brings me joy, most importantly. All right, I want to start this around it. Then you look out and you've got to say, is anyone interested in this? If it's zero, you're like, okay, I can't form a business around it but I still love this. Maybe I'll do a nonprofit or it's just going to be a hobby. So you got to ask that hard question first. Yeah. Or it might be, Oh, okay. There's enough. There's a, there's a million people that like this. That's not very big, but I'm going to do it because I'll be very niche. Some people make the mistake then and go, all right, let me do this other thing that has a hundred million people that like it, but that's not what you do. That's not your strength. That's, yeah. that's doomed for failure on all levels. And so that's what I mean about, the audience that's out there. When you start as well, Eric, I mean, a lot of people, they, uh, they try to build a brand across multiple platforms. What would you say is, is the best approach? Uh, is it to go hard on just one or try to be, to be strong in like various platforms? I'm more of a fan of going deep rather than, you know, you're broad and narrow. I'd rather mm -hmm. go narrow and deep. Okay. And so you might find out, oh my gosh, my whole audience, it's all TikTok. I'm just going to rock TikTok. If I have time, I'll sprinkle in some Instagram, some Twitter here and there. And then you go, so I would start with what you think. You're testing stuff. All of a sudden, this is, this is the thing. All right, I want to be the best at this thing. And then in time, then I'll layer on these other pieces. Yeah. But it's really about nailing that one thing. For us, because we had the animation pieces we did early on and they went viral, it was YouTube. Um, then in time, probably more LinkedIn these days. But really, it's an offline platform that I excel in. It's me on stage. Yeah. And so, so that's, we write books, we do podcasts. But I would say the strength is always the stage. 
And so we always got to not lose sight of that. Yes. That's a great advice too. Yeah. You've written five best-selling books. For those listening who don't know you, which one should they start with? The latest, the focus, the focus project, because it's one, the most timely as we go through this, come out through this pandemic. How mm-hmm. do I focus when there's constant change in the macro environment and also in my individual level? How do I stay focused on the big things versus the busy things? How do I reduce that stress? And so for sure, you should start with the focus project because it's a much broader book. And then the other books are a little more narrow. Um, but the focus project is a good example just to get in there. And it's, it's easy to read because it's all you can pick it up in the middle of the book and flip through because I told people don't read it A to Z. Figure out, okay, I got this. I understand this piece. All right, let me, there's 60,000 words in here, but I only need, most readers only need 40,000. Some need all 60, but some of them are like, all right, I got this piece. Oh, this is really what helps me. I'm going to flip to this piece. And so it's written in a modular format because people don't have a lot of time. (laughs) And so that's what it's it's all about. It's about energy management. It's about, I'm more energy management than time management, but it's like, hey, this book, just flip through it, figure out what resonates with yeah. you and go from there. Very good. Thanks for that, Eric. Um, there's a story about you meeting Barack Obama. How did that happen? Yeah, better be lucky than good. And it's <laughs> funny because some of my family's conservative. They're on the Republican side. So, and I'm a centrist. So it doesn't matter who the president is. You know, it's so funny that the world's came and have a, a conversation about stuff with politics. But if you're going to meet the president, you're probably going to take the opportunity to meet the president. And so fortunately, I was an Obama fan. I was, I was there to speak at South by Southwest. There's a huge conference in Austin, Texas. Yes. And so I was one of the speakers. And this is the year that it was like, south by southwest on steroids like it was <laughs> beyonce's coming to the interactive because she knows they have a music part of south by southwest all these celebrities are coming to the interactive because it was at the height of how do i use social and so i'm one of the speakers and the event was so big they had sitting president like he was the president at the time obama's opening the conference and michelle's closing the conference this is how big this this thing is it's huge. And what so, year was huge. that, by the way, Eric? I want to say, I'm thinking it's 2015. Okay. I think, yeah, maybe 14, 14 or 15, I'm guessing. Uh, check that, make sure he's in office, but. <laughs> that's fine, <laughs> that's, that's fine. <laughs> but anyways, he was speaking and then we're in this room and I could tell that at some point I'm going to meet him. And most of the people there are doing what you think they do. Like they haven't met the president. They're like, you're doing a good job. Nice to meet you, Mr. President. And so I'm looking over there. Like we talked about, you got to put yourself in the audience's shoes. So here I am. Yes. Gosh, how boring is that? He's got to do that every day. I'm sure every day it's a hundred handshakes, the same thing. Yeah. And so I'm going, what am I going to say to him that'll give him a little break? I go, what is he like? And I'm like, oh yeah, he loves basketball. His Michelle his brother, you know, coaches basketball, University of Oregon. And Obama's doing the brackets, March Madness. For those that don't know, they fill out brackets in the United States and try to win money for March Madness. It's a tournament, 6014. So he always did it once a year. He's a president writing down the brackets. Well, two out of three years, he'd pick Michigan State to win the whole thing. And we did terrible, which normally Michigan State does really well. They get to the Final Four. They yeah, they have a good team. Championship. Oh, normally, yeah. they have a really good team. So I'm like, all right, this is what I'm going to do. So I go up to him. I go, Mr. President, I know you're a basketball guy. I played basketball at Michigan State, and I just talked to Coach Izzo. He said, please, please do not pick us this year to win anything. You're jinxing the heck out of us. <laughs> and so fortunately, there's a photographer that took a picture of us laughing together like we're the best of buddies, like school chums for 40 years. So it was, it was fun. It was fun. Uh, and he was a super nice guy. I mean, he only had to be nice to me for a certain amount of time, but he was, he was super nice. That's amazing. That's an amazing story. I mean, he's such an inspirational leader, you know. It must have been amazing yeah. to, to have met him. So it's been amazing to have you on the show, Eric. Um, where can people find you to learn more about you online? 
Yeah, it's just equal man. So it's spelled exactly how it sounds. It's E Q U A L M A N. I'm spelling it out because literally after conferences, people ask me how to spell it, and I'm like, oh man, we gotta get back to some spelling here in the United States. But it's it's equal man uh, across the board. Thank you. It's been a pleasure to have you on the show, Eric. I've learned a lot. Um, loved your energy and your inspirational stories. I'm sure our audience learned a lot too. Find a lot, find a lot of inspiration from you as well. So thank you so much. No, thank you, Freddie. It's been great. Love it. A lot of gratitude for listening to Fika with Bryce. I really mean that. If you like the show, I would love if you can leave us a five-star review, whatever you're listening to your podcast. It helps us so much to get the word out there to other listeners. If you have any questions or any feedback, I would love to hear from you. I'm just a DM away on Instagram or TikTok at Freddie Van Hun. So looking forward to hearing from you guys. Thank you so much. Let's go!